But brethren, we shall be judged by the law under which we lived. For example, those who lived uh, as Gentiles uh, uh, during the time of the law of Moses, they, they would be judged according to the, the patriarchal law that was still in effect during the times of Moses. For the law of Moses was only for the Jews or for proselytes uh, who were Gentile converts to Judaism. And so then, then those Gentile converts to Judaism would have then be held accountable to the law of Moses. And so we understand that we are all judged according to the law under which we lived uh, in regards to God's law. So for the last 2,000 years during the Christian era, what law do we live under? We live under the law of Christ. And so the Jews sinned in the law means that they were subject to the law, the law of God. Therefore, they will be judged by the law. But notice now what it says now here in verse 13. It says uh, in chapter 2, For it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Notice the first half of that verse where it says, For it is not the hearers of the law who shall be justified, uh, who are just before God. So think about that for a moment. The Jews had the law uh, in their possession. Um, they had the law in their possession, but the Gentiles, in some cases, were living better lives than the Jews themselves. And so think about it, for, for example, and uh, it makes me think of James chapter 1. Notice what James chapter 1, verse 22 through 25 tells me. It says, But prove yourselves to be doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is, a, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror. For, for once he has looked at himself and go, goes away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. You know, when you look at the scriptures here, and you look at those verses, um, it also makes me think of James chapter 4 and verse 17. Notice that it says, Therefore, the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it to him it is sin. And so it's the doers of the law that shall be justified. Brothers and sisters, it is it's so crystal clear as we study out the scriptures that, that we need to make sure we're not forgetful hearers, but effectual doers, just like we just read in, in James chapter 1. We need to make sure that we're obedient to God because God has been calling his creation, mankind, to obedience ever since the, uh, ever since the garden. God gave Adam and Eve one rule. That's all they had, one rule, and he expected it to be uh, to, to them to live by that rule. Um, post the garden, uh, God had given them a law. We know that because uh, we look at examples of like uh, uh, Joseph. Uh, Joseph was, you know, hundreds of years before there ever was a law of Moses. And, and when Potiphar's wife was trying to get him to sleep with her and commit adultery, he says, I cannot sleep with another man's wife. How can I commit this great sin against, uh, against Potiphar and against God? Because it was a sin against God to commit adultery and to sleep with another man's wife. And this was a law that was in place even hundreds of years before there ever was a law of Moses. And so as we look at the scriptures here this evening, we need to understand that it's the doers of the law that will be justified. And how do we know? Does, does, does the scriptures really have anything else to say? Well, I'm glad you asked because we're going to look at Matthew chapter 7. And notice what it says in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24 through 27. It tells us, Therefore, everyone who hears the words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears the words of mine and does not act on them will be a foolish man, or will be like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And it fell, and great was its fall. Brothers and sisters, when you look at the, the scriptures here this evening, that's why it makes me think of, in, in Luke 6 and 46, this is not one I have a, a screenshot for, but Jesus asks the people that he was speaking to a simple question. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and yet do not do what I say? You look at the scriptures there in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24 and 20 through 7, that's on your screen. It says, a wise man is a man who built his house upon the rock. And the rains fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and they slammed against that house. And yet it did not fall because it was founded on the rock. It's talking about a man. It's talking about a, a man and his faith. 
Is your faith founded on Christ Jesus? Is your trust in the promises of God and, and of Jesus? Because if your trust is in the promises and not in, uh, not in circumstantial things, like in the world and the circumstances of the world, brethren, we understand that there's nothing that can happen to us uh, in, our, in, our ex in our existence here uh, on earth that can ever remove us from God's care, God's love, God's protection. So we don't have to fear coronavirus. We don't have to, um, we just have to trust in the promises. We have to keep the faith. We have to remain obedient no matter what is happening in the world around us, no matter what is happening in my career, no matter what is happening with my finances, no matter what is happening with my children, we remain true and steadfast and obedient to God, and we know that we trust and put our confidence in Him. All things will work out according to the way that they should, because we know God is in control of all things. And so Jesus asks a question in Luke 6 and 46. He says, why do you call me Lord and, and don't do what I say? So never forget that God can, God's command for, for all mankind is obedience. God wants obedience, and He expects it. God commands re repentance, and he expects it, as we learn in Acts chapter 17, verse 30 and 31. So now we get to verse 14 of Romans chapter 2, and it tells us, For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law unto themselves. So let's break that verse down for a minute. The first part of uh, verse 14 says, For when Gentiles who do not have the law, well, what is that talking about? It's talking about the Gentiles. Uh, they didn't have the law of Moses, and that's the law that it's talking about. They had a law that God had given them during the patriarchal period, uh, just like we learn about in Romans chapter 5 and verse 13, where it says, For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not charged where there is no law. I mean, think about it. We know that sin is, 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 is a transgression. We learn about that, uh, the transgression of the law. We learn about that in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. We know that Romans chapter 4 and verse 15 tells us, for the law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, there is no violation. And so we understand this point very clearly. The scriptures are clear by this. For the Gentiles became sinners because they violated a law, not just a governmental law. They violated God's law. And you're found to be a sinner when you violate God's law. And we remember that uh, there's, there's no amount of good works that we could ever do outside of the blood of Christ that could erase one sin. And so you look at the, the second half of verse 14, and it says, and they, talking about the Gentiles, do instinctively the things of the law. Well, what is it talking about in the second half of verse 14? It's talking about when they do practice things that are in the law, it's showing as a, it's a law that was written on their hearts. For the Gentiles did not have a written law, but when they do the things of the law, because it becomes a law unto themselves. And so, however, when you look at some of their practices, some of the things that they practiced and some of the things that they did and how they lived their lives, they were more righteous and holy than God's uh, chosen people, the Jews, the Israelites. And so many times uh, you, you see how um, the people who were Gentiles um, were found pleasing in God's sight. And so in, in, in many ways, and there's many examples of that, you know, so as you look at the last part of verse 14, it says, these things not having the law are a law unto themselves. Now we get to verse 15, and it says, and if they, meaning Gentiles, show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately either accusing or else defending them. So what is verse 15 telling us? Verse, the first half of verse 15 says, in that they show the work of the law written on their hearts. Well, to, to show the work of the law written on their hearts it simply means that they were sin sincerely giving heed uh, to, to certain principles found written even in the law, though they weren't even though they weren't subject to that law. Uh, the Gentiles were keeping some of the laws that were found in the law of Moses better than what the Jews were doing. If you look at the Ten Commandments, for example, those commandments, those that, that mo those moral absolutes, are any different than what God had given uh, to the to the uh, the Gentiles during the patriarchal period. And, and, and to all mankind during the patriarchal period, except for one, which was keep the Sabbath day. And so, but you look at the rest of the, the Ten Commandments, all those were in effect um, during, uh, during the patriarchal period, and they continued to be in effect. The law of Moses was just then, um, you had the, the, the priesthood, and then you also had the sacrificial system. 
that was added unto those moral codes. And then they were expand, uh, expounded upon in more, more detail. And so as you continue to, to look at these verses here, um, Paul is arguing that to be custodians of the law was not good enough. You see, the Jews, they, 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 they thought themselves, they thought too much of themselves. They thought too highly of themselves because they were custodians of the law. But just being a custodian of the law is not good enough because you have to obey the law. And that's why James chapter 1 uh, that we looked at earlier was so very important. James chapter 1, verse 22 through 25. Because we need to make sure we don't become the custodians of the law who, who are forgetful hearers and not effectual doers. And so we need to be effectual doers and never laying apart any side of in, any part of the law. You know, you look at verse 15 and it mentions the Gentiles' conscience. Well, what is that talking about? If you examine some, uh, so let's examine, for example, some of the reasons that we cannot live by conscience only. You know, the conscience must be educated. Uh, when we think about faith comes from hearing, hearing from what? Hearing from the Word of God. We learned about that in Romans 10 and 17. And so as we think about faith come from, uh, faith comes from hearing, hearing from the Word of God, think about how the conscience must be educated. Think about some of these passages of Scripture. The next one that we're going to look at is Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6. Notice that it says that we are to train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. We also remember that when we look at Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6, that this is a principle. It's not a guarantee, but the fact remains that we are to train up our children in the way that they should go. We should train up our children in, in the ways of the Lord, uh, in the ways of the church, uh, teaching them all the statues of God. So that way, as they grow and they leave our homes, then they're going to be able to uh, live spiritually and not find themselves in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a spiritual situation to where they're spiritually dead because they're not living for God. They're living for themselves. They're not living for um, righteousness. They're living for worldly, worldliness. And so we, we remember that we're to train up our children. The next scripture we're going to look at is Acts chapter 23 and verse 1. And in Acts chapter 23 and verse 1, notice what it says. Paul, looking intently at the council, said, Brethren, I have lived my life with a perfectly good conscience before God to up to this day. Well, what was Paul talking about? Paul was trained up in the law of Moses, and then Paul was also trained up in the law of Christ. And no matter which law he was under, his worldview and his life's decisions reflected those standards, reflected the law in which he lived. When he was Saul, and he was holding the coats and standing by as Stephen was being stoned to death, being murdered, and we know that he uh, received the, the letters from the chief priest in order to, to go out and to persecute those of, of the way, talking about Christianity, uh, breaking apart families, imprisoning people, uh, standing by and giving his approval, hearty approval as, as, as somebody was stoned to death uh, that was against Judaism. He did it with a clear conscience because he was living his life um, and, and thought he was doing everything he was doing for God. And then when Jesus calls him on the road to Damascus, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He says, Lord, who is it that I am persecuting? And he says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And then we know the rest of the story. And we know that now, now Saul gives his life over to servitude to Christ Jesus. And so no matter which law he was under, his worldview, his life's decisions, reflected the standard of the law in which he was governed his life. You know, our conscience cannot be our only guide. It, it absolutely can't be our only guide because we might believe a lie. And people believe lies all the time. It's, as, as I've said before, it's easier to believe a lie you've heard a thousand times than it is to believe the truth you may have only heard once. And so many of the people around the world who believe in man-made gods and man-made theology, uh, they fall into this trap of, of, of man-made lies. Um, that they would rather wor worship the, the, the creature rather than the creator, like we looked at in verse uh, chapter, uh, chapter 1, starting in verse 18 of Romans. You know, you look at our conscience. Our conscience cannot be our only guide because we are saved by faith, and faith comes from hearing the words of God. And that's why I often say it's, it's salvation through education, just like Jeremiah chapter 31 and 31 taught, because we need to be taught the principles of God. And that's why we need to not be afraid to talk to friends, family members, co-workers about our faith, about our love for Jesus and his love for us. 
and the sacrifice that he made. And that Jesus prayed in John chapter 17 that we would be unified and we would be unified as one body, the church, and that we would all come together with one standard, just like we learned about in, in uh, 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1 and verse 3, when Paul was about to leave for Macedonia, and he encouraged, uh, he encouraged Timothy to stay on at Ephesus. Why? So he, so he could make sure certain men weren't strange doctors. You see, because there was a pattern of teachings that had already gone out into the world, guided and led by the Holy Spirit. And so we understand these things. And that's why Romans 10 and 17 says what it says. Faith comes from hearing, hearing from the word of God. Also, remember that Jesus said, you are set free by the truth. He didn't say you're set free by your conscience. He said you're set free by the truth. Look at this next passage of scripture. In John chapter 8 and verse 32, notice that it says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You see, it's salvation by education, as I mentioned. You look at the next passage of Scripture uh, in Matthew chapter 4 here in a second. You know, if our conscience is our only guide, then when we think about our conscience being our only guide, then truth is truly subjective, then will it not be? And everyone who is honest is right no matter what he believes. But notice what it says in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4. Matthew 4 and verse 4 says, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? By every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You see, brothers and sisters, just like we looked at last week, we understand that in John chapter 12, verse 48 through 50, we know that the scriptures uh, is what is going to judge us in the last day. For Jesus said, I didn't come to judge the world, but to save the world. But you have one that judges you. The words that will judge you in the last day, uh, the, 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 let me repeat that. Lost my train of thought. In John chapter 12 and verse 48 through 50, Jesus says, I didn't come to judge the world, but to save the world. But you have one who judges you. The words in which I speak in the last day is what will judge you in the end. And so we understand that. And so also remember in 1 John uh, chapter 3 and verse 4 that I mentioned earlier, it tells us how uh, whoever so commits sin transgresses the law. For sin is the transgression of a law. And so we understand that for our conscience cannot be our only guide because a thing would be both true and false at the same time if left up to our conscience without being educated with the actual uh, standard and principles of God. And so we understand that in Jeremiah in chapter 31, it says, no longer will you tell your neighbors to know the Lord. He says, for all will know me because they will be taught. And how will they be taught? They'll be taught the very principles and the standards that come in the old and the new covenants. And as we continue to look at this, we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10 as I go through this little journey of putting the pieces of the puzzle together to help us to fully understand Romans chapter 2. And it makes me think of this um, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, which says, Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that you all agree, notice what it says, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you. What is it talking about? It's talking about divisions in accordance to the standards of God. He says, I pray that, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, and that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. You know, when we look at that verse right there, it's such a powerful verse because we can only be of the same mind if we all adhere to the same standard. And that's why it's so very important to ask yourself uh, what your worldview is. What, what makes up your worldview? Is your worldview based on worldliness, based on um, what society says is right and wrong? Because you see, the problem with that is, when you leave it subjective, that with every generation, they'll teach you that something else is right and something else is wrong, and then they'll, and, 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 and you'll, you'll be in a state of uh, constant confusion because Right and wrong is constantly changing based on individuals. If you ever study the book of Judges, the book of Judges is, is, is a perfect example of this. The very last verse of the last chapter of the book of Judges tells us that everybody did what was, what was right according to his own mind, what was right in his own sight. And so, brethren, if, if we leave it to be subjective, we are in a world of trouble because we are, our standards are so vastly um, inadequate when it comes to God's standard, God's moral absolutes. And trust me when I say there are moral absolutes, if you've ever studied the scriptures even a little bit, you'd know there's moral absolutes 
just like 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 10 was talking about. He is imploring them that they, there would be no divisions among them, but that they be of the same mind and of the same spirit and of the same judgment. Why? Because that way they know that they're moving forward in one mind as a unified body and not according to what each standard of each person was. So exactly what does the conscience do for us then? Well, the conscience is a prodder, if you will, to prod something. And so it's not, it's not the body of truth itself, but it's something that pricks our hearts. Because when you come to the full knowledge of the truth and you hear the word of God, you believe it and you make it the standard of your life, as you sin, you should have godly sorrow. And that godly sorrow is what is, should cause you to repent and to turn back to God so you can stay in relationship with God. For it tells us in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 26, and I don't have a slide for this one, just comes to the top of mind, that, actually, let's turn over there. Hebrews chapter 10, and I want us to look at verse 26 for a moment. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 26 tells me, for if we go on sinning willfully after, full, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a, a sacrifice for our sins but a certain terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of fire, which will consume the adversaries. So what did we just learn from Hebrews chapter uh, 10 and verse 26? That if we go on sinning willfully, meaning after we've come to the knowledge of the truth of God's word and we don't care and we sin anyways, because that's just what I enjoy. That's what I want to do. I'm willing to, I'm willing to do these things, but I'm going to draw the line here because now it's starting to infringe on the things that I like. You see, when you put your standard above God's standard, then you sin willfully, and there no longer remains a sacrifice for your sins. And you'll find yourself spiritually in a spiritually dead state because now you're falling outside of God's standard. And this whole, uh, all the lies about once saved, always saved, is one of the biggest false doctrines uh, to ever be taught in the history of the world because you can easily fall away from the, uh, from, from the, uh, from the word of God. And so the scriptures are clear about that. There's so many passages that we can look at in another study another day to show that, which we have in the past. Remember what it says in Romans 2 and in, in Romans chapter 2 and verse 15, and that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately either accusing or else defending them. You see, brethren, we can never go. We can never go against our conscience and be right. However, we can allow the conscience, we cannot allow the conscience to be our only guide. So now we get to verse uh, 16 of chapter 2. And in verse 16 of chapter 2, it says, On the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. Well, the last five verses are key to the question so many ask. So, so you're saying that all the people who haven't heard of Jesus aren't Christians? Or, or, or all the people who haven't heard of Jesus or are not Christians, that God is going to condemn them to hell? Brothers and sisters, it's simple, that those who know the law of Christ will be judged by it. Those who do not know the law will be judged according to their actions, and their conscience will either accuse or defend them, as we learn there in verse 16. But remember, even those who have never heard of, of Jesus, and they violate their conscience even once, they are guilty of sin and need the blood of Christ to cover them. So can we, can we get to heaven if we have even one sin in our lives, but we've never, heard, we've never heard of Jesus? And the answer is no, because that's what the scriptures tell us. For it says in Romans chapter 3 and in verse 23, notice what it says on your screen there. Romans 3 and 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For God knows that there has never been a man or a woman or a child who has not sinned, who's of, of, of the age of accountability. And so when we look at this, we know that all mankind is under sin. Remember earlier, we looked at what sin was. Sin is a violation of the law. Well, whose law? God's law. And so if we have violated God's law at one time or another, then the only way that we could be uh, free of sin is to be washed in the blood of Christ. And we contact that blood in baptism. And that's why in Acts chapter 2, when Peter was preaching the first, uh, basically, gospel message, gospel sermon, and the, and the brethren were pricked to the heart, and 3,000 of them said, what must we do? He said, repent, 
and confess Jesus. Confess Jesus, be baptized for the remission of your sins. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and, you re and you'll be added to the, to the Lord's church. You'll be added to the kingdom of God. Brothers and sisters, let's look now as we continue on. And we're going to actually read 17 through 24 as we get closer to the end of this chapter now. And as we get there, it says this in verse 17. But if you bear the name Jew and rely upon the law and boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are essential, being instructed out of the law, and are confident that you yourselves are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, having the law, the embodiment of the knowledge of the truth. You, therefore, who teach another, do you teach yourself? You who preach that one shall not steal, do you steal? You who say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law through your breaking of the law, do you dishonor God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, just as it is written. You know, as we look at these verses here, brethren, Notice in verse 24, it says, For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Never forget that the way that we act and the way that we live reflects on God. There are, there's a reason why when people look at some Christians, they call them hypocrites. Why? Because even non-Christians understand the concept that Christians are to be different. We're to live differently. We're to think differently. We're to talk differently. We're to show our love and compassion and mercy differently than those in the world who don't know God. Not saying that those in the world can't show love or compassion and mercy without knowing God, but they'll never live according to God's standard where it talks about we are to be an others-centered person and not self-centered people. Rather, we're to put people first, and that's the agape love that the gospel message talks about. And it's the agape love that, that, that caused Jesus to want to come to this earth, take on flesh and bone, become man, be tempted in every way that we're tempted, and yet live a life without sin. Why? Because he loved us so much that he knew why he was doing it. Because he was going to the cross. He was marching to the cross. Why? To take upon the sins of all mankind on his wide shoulders. And, he had, and, and as he was crucified that day, on the day of Calvary, Brethren, we understand that he took away the sins of the world, and it's by the blood of Christ that we are bought, and it's by the blood of Christ that we are set free from sin if we are willing to live our lives faithful till the end. Notice what it tells us as we look at some of the scriptures. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 1, notice what it says on your screen there. It says, All who are under the yoke as slaves are to regard their own masters as worthy of all honor so that the name of God and our doctrine will not be spoken against. So remember that it said there in the, at the end of that verse, um, in verse, uh, what is that? It's in verse 24, it says, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles. Well, notice how that coincides with what Paul wrote to Timothy. It says that, so that the name of God and our doctrine will not be spoken against. So it won't be blasphemed. And so we look at the next section of scripture, and that's in Titus chapter 2. In Titus chapter 2, verse 3 through 5, notice what it tells us. It says, Older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands. And why does it say all that? Well, it tells you at the end of verse 5, so the word of God will not be dishonored. You see, if you're, if you're a woman and you're a child of God, you're a Christian woman, and yet you weren't living in these, in these things that, it, that Paul is instructing Titus to instruct to the, to the members of the church, if you're not living according to that standard, then God can be blasphemed. The church can be blasphemed. There's a reason why if I go out and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm involved in drunkenness and sexual immorality, and I have a, a lying tongue, and I gossip, and I slander, and I do all these things, but I tell people, if they ask her, hey, are you a Christian? Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. They, they're going to say, you're a hypocrite. Why? Because even they know, the world even knows, that we're called to a higher standard, a higher moral standard. And so as we continue to look at the scriptures here tonight, I firmly believe that many in the world are disobedient. Um, I, I firmly believe that many in the world are disobedient to the gospel 
uh, because of unfaithful Christians. But there's a message that I want to make sure I get across here tonight because it really is something that drives me nuts. And so if, if, you're, if you have left the church for any length of time because of something that has happened to you from another member, another congregation, or just another individual, then your faith was in man and not in God. You see, because if our faith is in God, then we'll never leave his church because we know how precious his sacrifice was. We know how greatly he loves us and that we love him because he first loves us, as we learned about in, in, in 1 John. And so as we look at the scriptures here tonight, notice another, uh, uh, I want you also to notice another scripture. Before it also said at the end, just as it is written. And that brings us to Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 5. Notice what it says. Now, therefore, what do I have here? declares the Lord, seeing that my people have been taken away without cause. Again, the Lord declares, those who rule over them howl, and my name is continuously blasphemed all day long. Brothers and sisters, we need to always understand that how we live as God's creation, as God's faithful children, matters. And the way you speak, the way you talk, the way you think matters. The things that you participate in matters. And if you're more worldly than you are uh, than you are godly, you need to evaluate your life. You need to evaluate your priorities. You need to evaluate your choices. If you if 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 the bulk of your friends are made up of worldly individuals and not brothers and sisters in Christ, ask yourself if you're going to be eventually led astray. Because that's what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33. And so as we look at the scriptures here tonight, we continue on in verse 25 of Romans chapter 2. As we get ready to come to the end of this chapter, it says, For indeed, circumcision is of value if you practice the law. But if you are a transgressor of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So if the uncircumcision of man keeps the requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? So what is that verse telling us in verse 25 and 26? So some of the Gentiles, they lived better lives than some of the Jews did. Just like some who haven't heard the gospel uh, live better lives than some of us that confess Christ. There are people out there living more uh, lives that are more loving, more compassionate, more forgiving than certain individuals who claim Christ as their, as their, as their master and their savior. And that should never be so. The Gentile had no command to be circumcised. But God approves his, approved his life when he kept the righteousness of the law. And meaning that if he did the things instinctively of the law, it was a law that was written on his heart. And then we get to verse 27 and through the end of this chapter. And it tells us in verse, chapter 2, verse 27. And he who is physically uncircumcised, if he keeps the law, will he not judge you who, though having the letter of the law and, and circumcision, are a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And the circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. So as we get to the end of chapter 2 here tonight, and we look at this, and just a question about verse 29. What, what is verse 29 telling us? Open your Bibles and, and turn your Bibles over to uh, Romans chapter 7 and verse 6. I have it on my slide as well, if you'd rather look at it there. But in Romans chapter 7 and verse 6, as we look to evaluate verse 29, it says, But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. What is he talking about? It's talking about how the law, of, uh, the law of Moses was nailed to the cross. And the Jew is no longer to live according to the old law. Read verse 29 again. Romans chapter 2 and verse 29 says, But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. Talking about who? Gentiles or anybody else that, that follows the law of God. And circumcision is that which is of the heart. By the Spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from men, but from God, because those who, not, who didn't have the law instinctively did the things of the law, and those who, who had the law, meaning the Jews, the Israelites, didn't uh, adhere to the law. They became forgetful hearers, and they weren't effectual doers, as James uh, tells us in J James chapter 1. 
And now we get to 2 Corinthians. And I have this, uh, this scripture that I can pull up for you on the screen. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, notice what it says in verse 4 and 6. Such confidence we have through Christ towards God. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant. Notice what it says, as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. The Holy Spirit seals us for the day of redemption. Brothers and sisters, even though we were sealed for the day of redemption, we still must, we still must pick up our cross daily. Otherwise, we will all likewise perish. That's the end of chapter 2. That's the end of our Wednesday night study. Next week, we're going we're to get into chapter 3 and uh, dive deep into it to fully understand what uh, the Holy Spirit is teaching us uh, and teaching the Romans through the Apostle Paul in Rome. Brethren, let's go to God in prayer before we end this Bible study. Most gracious Heavenly Father, I come to you at this time, Father God, and I thank you so much. I thank you for this opportunity to be able to, to sit here tonight, even though there's distance between us, with my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, fellow saints in the kingdom, as we study your, your word, as we study uh, all that the scriptures teach, Father, and how we are to live and how we are to do all things to your glory. Father God, I just pray that, uh, that you place a hedge of protection around each of our families that are here tonight that are listening. Keep us safe from this coronavirus. And I just pray, Father God, for all those uh, the doctors and me medical workers, Father, all the first responders on the front lines, the EMTs and others, Father, who are out there and, and desperately uh, working and, and putting themselves in harm's way for the good of, and, of, all, all their, um, of all the people in their communities. And we pray a special blessing on them that you, that you keep, uh, keep their strength, keep up their strength, Father. We pray that they're, uh, not only do you keep their strength up, we pray that um, they can do their job to their best of their ability. And we pray, Father God, blessings on them as they do this. Father, we pray for all those who have contracted this virus. We pray uh, that their health and strength can be restored because we know that you are the great physician. But we also know, Father God, that's why it's so very important that we live each and every day as if it's our last. Because we never know when, that, that when our time is going to come. And so we give our lives over to you and service to you. And uh, because we know of the great sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf. And so, Father God, I just pray for all those who may hear this message tonight. And maybe you're not a child of God. I just pray, Father, that something that can be said can prick their hearts. I pray that they'll want to make Jesus the Lord of their life. I pray that they'll want to be baptized for the remission of their sins. And you too will add them to the body of Christ. I pray, Father God, for all those that are, that are in the world uh, that have not come to the knowledge of the truth of your word, that they would do so at this time. Father, may we all reflect upon the truths of your word, your moral standards, and the sacrifice of your son. Father, we thank you and ask you for all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everyone.